Phillies and gentle Colts, it has been a while. Welcome to Vos de Sueños. Welcome to Vos de Sueños After Dark. I am your host. Today we have So Long and Thanks for All the Ponies, Part 14 by Sir Ginger, edited by Farve. Guys, I know it's been a while. I am still looking at webcams for scenarios. I have not heard much about the Doctor Who's project, but the first episode is recorded. And I will let you know where we're going from here. But today, I bring you another fanfic. Author's note. I love deadlines. I love the whooshing sound they make as they fly by. Douglas Adams. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, and so is Vos. But frankly, I can't maintain releases on top of university work and army life. Every chapter will be released when it's done, hopefully frequently enough to keep you all interested. I can't promise anything better, so I beg patience. <laughs> you have no idea. This chapter sees the regal return as Farve, my proofreader, and with it the associated drop in typing errors. Edit. Oh dear, the first ling got derped. I'll use this time to add an endorsement for Canterlot Follies, my current favorite fanfic. Douglas Adams cited P.G. Woodenhouse as his favorite comedy author, so you know. Oh, and I happen to be drinking tea for this. I figured it was important. Oh, that's really good. I'm glad we have more of that. In the galaxy, there are multiple planets which have been named by their residents as the Earth, or the local language equivalent. Mostly because for most races still bound to a single planet, they are used to standing on Earth, so it fits. It really is a very unimaginative name for a planet, which is why most races, upon making interstellar contact, swiftly change the name to something with a bit more attitude and pizzazz. The planet upon which Equestria exists, for example, is known occasionally as the Earth, but very few ponies would ever bother to think of themselves as living anywhere other than Equestria. This particular Earth was demolished immediately after another planet of the same name, but had the singular luck of being remade almost instantly, unlike the one unfortunate enough not to have a pair of pony deities to intervene. It is this remade Earth that our heroines escaped from, and it is a planet with a complicated history. After its initial creation, the sisters more or less abandoned flying the planet to go enjoy themselves, booking a table at Milliways, crashing the great flying party, and getting into heated arguments with the Asgardian pantheon over the correct toilet paper orientation, the Asgardians favoring under like the barbarians they are. During their absence, the ponies they had left behind fractured into three nations, the Pegasi, the Unicorns, and the Earth Ponies. The unification which brought about the nation of Equestria under the flag of their absentee goddesses, which was marred by their appearance, several decades later, by the spirit of chaos and disharmony, Discord. No pony knew where he came from, why he desired to rule, or why his rule was consisted solely of making logic his eternal bitch. Suffice to say, life in Equestria was both miserable and totally chaotic for a time, until the royal sisters returned and found another god effectively squatting. His imprisonment enabled the nation of Equestria to blossom as it never had done before, with the sisters cured of their wanderlust and finally ready to take on the responsibility of running a planet properly. Until that whole business with Nightmare Moon. But we don't talk about that anymore. But all that, as they say, is ancient history. The planet of Trivador was slowly silencing itself. Every settlement had seen the ship travel past, heard the ungodly loud music coming from it, and had seen the ever-growing cloud of creatures beneath. And, in every settlement, there had been some pony smart enough to put two and two and two together. By the time our heroes arrived back at the original settlement, the tower had not only been shut off, but there was a growing argument over whether it should be left standing as a precaution, or the more popular option of tearing it down and smashing it to hundreds of pieces. Some of the ponies stepping out had expressions of wonder. Some had tears in their eyes. Everywhere, 
earplugs were being torn out, doors were being opened, and conversations were being held at something less than a shout. As soon as the Heart of Gold touched down, those who had even the most basic understanding of what had happened rushed towards it. Inside, Zaphod was almost hopping up and down with glee. He wouldn't because that was fundamentally uncool, but the thought was there. Here was his payoff. Here, he would finally be going down to that ego stroking that he had been missing for so long. He had his gem-encrusted boots, his best and most luridly coloured jacket, in which he had cut a hole so his smiling face was visible and his flank was as well. He had turned up the volume on his teeth speakers, and his presidential sash was across his shoulders. Rarity eyed him with distaste, but it was clear that she was happy to be going outside. Fluttershy, on the other hoof, took one look outside at the happy faces and shook her head firmly. I, I think I want to stay inside, actually. Dash turned with an incredulous face. Come on, you've been in front of crowds like this before. Remember when we beat Discord? I don't think I can. Oh, for Celestia's sake, Fluttershy, what's the matter? Fluttershy was obviously casting around for an excuse. I, I really don't want to. She was looking upset and backing away from the door. Rarity took control. Really, Dash, I don't understand you sometimes. Can't you see she's not up to it at the moment? She looked at Fluttershy kindly. Do you want to come inside and talk to me about it? A nod. Okay, then. You two go outside and bask in the praise to your gaudy heart's content. We shall stay inside. We can leave as soon as you have received your required number of bro-hoofs for the day. The inverted commas were placed around the words bro-hoof, with the delicacy of an upper-class lady selecting the right fork at the dinner table, distancing rarity from associating with the word. Dash and Zaphod shared a look. Sorry, Shy. We'll be back before long, okay? So long, ladies. The fruit has some crabs to surf. They blitzed off the ramp into the outside town. Now, dear, whatever is the matter? Oh, oh, I know we had to, but... Fluttershy was looking increasingly stricken. The parasprites. Fluttershy nodded. I know we had to so those poor ponies could have better lives, but... Oh, it's just so horrible. Darling, I think we need to talk about the concept of sentience. Twilight gave me a long talk about it one day. Why did she do that? Rarity grimaced. If you must know, I saw Tom there, outside my house one rainy day, and, oh, I know it's silly, but I, I just couldn't leave him out there in the rain. Twilight caught me, and... She paused, trying him off with a towel. Fluttershy suppressed a watery smile. You won't tell anyone, will you? Of course not, Fluttershy said, smiling through her tears. Anyway, my point is that these parasprites, well, they can't really think for themselves. They aren't intelligent, and it's not like they've suffered, dear. We gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go! Dash burst into the room at top speed. Excuse me, dear. We really zark and need to go. Zaphod was just behind her. What in Equestria is going on? Zaphod was already at a panel trying desperately to get the ship flying. I may have made them a little angry with me somehow. <laughs> he grinned. What precisely did you do? Rarity quizzed. All I said is that we could replace the song with my autobiography as written, edited, and read by me for a very reasonable 100 Altarian dollars, order now and receive limited edition Zaphod Beeblebrox TM branded sunglasses. And play that constantly! He grinned cheekily, as if making a whole population of turning 180 degrees from hospitality to hostility was the sort of prank one would be mildly berated for. He felt the ship hum into life as the first thrown rock impacted against the metal where, coincidentally enough, it left a smudge of dirt the exact shape of the city of Philadelphia. This is not noted for any significance. It was just a thing that happened. I've never seen anything like it, said Dash, sounding almost impressed. Not even in ten seconds. Not even ten seconds to go from love to hate. 
She respected speed in more or less anything, reasoning that if one was to do anything, even something stupid, it might as well be done rapidly. The ship blasted away from the surface, quickly clearing the atmosphere to the point where the drive could be safely and humanely activated, and a few random objects were left floating in space. A cuckoo clock, several large rats, and a poorly translated book of nursery rhymes. And, floating with them, almost in the shape of the smile, was a series of blobs and a dark brown liquid. Free blocking is an extreme sport practiced in some of the most relaxed and least responsible parts of the galaxy with varying legality. It is immensely simple and consists of sitting oneself on an old-fashioned Splorkrack 5000 miniaturized starship engine and then attempting, by leaning and varying thrusting, to propel oneself at stupidly high speeds from point A to point B, with a maximum of style and a minimum of broken limbs. By very carefully adjusting thrust, it is possible to hover, and by leaning forward and increasing the thrust minutely, it is possible to move forwards, often with altogether too much forwards and either too little or too much hover. Free sporkers who don't find themselves dashed against the ground at high speeds sometimes find themselves entering orbit at an even higher speed, and it is a subject of debate which fate is worse. It represents a near-perfect extreme sport, fulfilling almost all prerequisites perfectly, highly dangerous, unnecessarily fast, and falling under many definitions of batical. Furthermore, any freeze blocker who survives long enough to continue his hobby past a certain age looks ridiculous, another important tell. Professional freeze blockers have been logged at speeds of over 800 kilometers an hour, earning them prodigious praise which is very occasionally not posthumous. Dude is an avid freeze-blocker, and had he had the time, he would have certainly attempted to show off to his newfound friends. It is fortunate, therefore, that it was at this moment, as he was on the point of suggesting, they came outside to view his most utterly awesome tricks, that the laws of logic were happily put through the ringer. It was only a mild ringer, and our four looked around as sparks of light erupted from every metal surface in the room, and a small pile of fish began to form in the middle of the room, only to wink out of existence with a whiff of the smell of roses and, inevitably, herring. Everything settled down again, the moo of a small cat fading, as the probabilities normalized again. Twilight shook herself. Man! Dude called, leaning back further. Warn me when you're gonna use that damn thing! You're freaking me out, crazy dude! What in the hay was that? Applejack said, having shaken her head to clear it. <laughs> Just messing with the finite improbability generator. Crazy shit, man, but fun! Applejack turned to Pinky. Could that thing get us to the others? I'm sorry, no, it's not powerful enough, and it's messing with the local probabilities in a strange way. I think it would be impossible for the infinite improbability drive to even get here while that thing is on. There was a whoosh. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is dismissive on the subject of luck, and the subject of coincidence. The guide says that, in a universe that is, so far at least, infinite in size, anything can and eventually will happen. However, it would be to a strange observer who did not question the ridiculous convenience of being picked up by a passing starship, while well, not only on a planet, but inside a building, and it happening to be a ship one was hoping to get picked up by. This it was, however, that now happened to Twilight Sparkle and her companions, who now found themselves in a strange landscape indeed. For the moment, it seemed to be composed entirely of live monkeys who chattered cheerfully as they waved in the breeze. What? Twilight's voice was leaden. Um... Pinkie Pie was staring around her. I guess I sort of asked for that, huh? The world, as if in answer, closed in around them, then exploded neatly into confetti, 
revealing the interior of a spaceship. 200 to 1 against and fading. And oh, we have some new visitors, guys. Isn't that neat? A loud, tinny voice broke through the room as flowers sprouted from the walls, only to each burst into purple flame with a tiny trumpet call. <laughs> there was a pause. Well, I'm sorry, buddy. We just picked them up. Don't you like picking people up? Another pause. 100 to 1 against and falling. The voice sounded a little sulky, as if it had been insulted or told off. This is it, ain't it? Said Applejack, staring about her. The infinite improbability ship or whatever the damn thing is. Sure is. We hadn't even got to Medeus yet, and you said it was almost impossible. Looks like I was right. Pinky sing-songed happily. Improbability factor one to one, normality restored came the voice again from overhead, back to its cheery self. Applejack and Twilight struggled for words. But... What? I, I don't even... What the buck? Pinky smiled gently. It's just how the silly thing works. Logic gets all funny. Now get ready. We get to go see our friends again. And that was So Long and Thanks for All the Ponies, Part 14. Thank you for sticking with me. I promise more things soon. Adam and I are talking about writing the next episode of ESR. I'm looking at webcams now that Christmas is over, and we're talking more about scenarios. And I may just record past sins chapter, I don't know, 15, whatever's next, sometime soon. Thank you all for sticking with me. It's good that you're here. I'm glad you're back, and safe travels, everypony. Cheers.